Diwani Wandi in person from the UN Nation down on the south coast of what's now New South Wales, um, down around the Nara Shoalhaven area. Um, I'm a traditional owner of those lands. I'm also one of the founders and the current national president of the Black People's Union. Um, so today uh, we're just going to go through a few different things. Um, I just want to touch on some of the uh, different, I suppose you could say propaganda that's out there around um, Indigenous people and our history. I'm trying to dispel some of those myths and just touch on some of the definitions of stuff like sovereignty, self-determination, land back, et cetera, and what it actually means from a grassroots organising perspective. So, um, yeah, there's no real sort of order to do this in, I suppose. Um, I guess we would just kind of like jump into it from the earliest point in history and then kind of work our way to the future. Um, so start off with, we're going to talk a bit about uh, pre-colonial Indigenous culture, um, just touch on what our economics and politics lo look like and, you know, what sort of systems they're similar to that exist today. So before colonisation, uh, Indigenous people were very communal. Um, the proper terminology to use would be proto-communist uh, to describe our culture and our economics. Um, we had a very communal understanding, a very communal fashioned um, society and culture. We didn't have any of this sort of like individualism. There was no exploitation or oppression of other members of your clan or your nation. Um, none of this, you know, capitalist exploitation like what you see today. It was very much a culture that was geared, you know, towards the people, by the people, for the people. So um, as the Black People's Union, I suppose, you know, well, that's something that we try and incorporate today and something that we're moving towards. But um, yeah, these this sort of economy and this sort of uh, political culture allowed us to actually achieve a lot of things um, thousands or even tens of thousands of years before people around the rest of the world were. Um, this is something that unfortunately isn't often spoken about in our education, uh, especially in our you know, primary and high schools. Um, we are quite often portrayed as you know, this noble savage and this hunter-gatherer sort of population when in actual fact, we were quite an industrial people before colonization. Um, just to touch on a few examples of that. Uh, if you look up in Queensland, for example, you will find the biggest strip mines in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this is pre-colonization. We had massive sandstone and limestone mines up in Queensland that were the, the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere until you know very, very recently. Um, there was literally thousands of them up there but we were able to do this for thousands of years in a way where it didn't have massive impacts and detriments to the local environment. Um, other examples are budge bim, the fish and eel traps out in Western New South Wales and Northwest Victoria. Um, they were, until the construction of the Great Wall of China, they were actually the largest stone structure in the world. And until this day, they remain the second largest stone structure ever created. Um, we had, Stone masonry here, something like 30,000 years ago, up in the Northern Territory, the first stone masonry happened. Um, the world didn't see stone masonry again for another nearly 20,000 years, and that was over in the Middle East. But um, yeah, just to give you a bit of an example of you know little things like this, we we had all these sort of developments. We had even stone villages down in Victoria that were you know 10,000 years old. Um, you know, the next oldest structure in the world, also at 10,000 years old, isn't a village though; it's a temple over in the Middle East. Um, but, you know, it was many thousands of years after that before we saw other stone villages popping up in places like Europe. Um, so, you know, we were far and much more advanced than, you know, what is portrayed. Um, you know, we also had stuff like the first, um, the first star maps in the world that were the first, you know, known star maps in the world. Um, they're all over Australia. We've got um, stuff similar to Stonehenge, again, all over Australia. Um, some of these examples, like the one just west of what is now Sydney, uh, unfortunately no longer exists. The you know, colonisers of the day pulled it apart to use the stones to build their houses and their fences and whatever else and stuff. But um, you know, this stone structure was something like, I think it was 10 times the size of Stonehenge, but with a very similar layout. And you know, it was again, just like Stonehenge was used to you know, map the stars, map the sun, map the seasons, et cetera. But yeah, we had, you know, all this massive ingenuity right across Australia. And today, you know, we're portrayed as some noble savages and just hunter-gatherers. Um, another big thing, of course, is agriculture. Um, you know, it's 
spoken about that Blackfellas didn't have agriculture. There's a lot of debate there. Um, I know there's a lot of work that's gone into discredit people like Bruce Pascoe. Um, but if you actually go and look at the journals of the early uh, colonists that came to Australia, they themselves actually speak about the agricultural advancements we had here in Australia. Um, I can't remember the exact word for word quote, but there's actually a quote in one of their journals when they were first traveling across the countryside through what is now Sydney, they remarked that it was the most manicured and looked after a state they had ever seen. Um, you know, there was crops that stretched for as far as I could see in every direction, no fences or anything like that. It was just one big massive open plan agricultural state. And much of the East Coast of Australia was a part of this massive agricultural state. It stretched over, you know, several, several dozens, maybe even close to a hundred nations, if not more. Now, these sort of advancements, these sort of cooperation is not something that you could see in any sort of capitalist system. This stuff could only happen because we were a communal people and we operated under you know, fundamental principles of what we see today in communism. Um, yeah, but I suppose, you know, moving on a bit from that, um, if anyone's got any more questions about that stuff towards the end, by all means, ask away. Um, I could talk for hours about that subject alone. But um, yeah, you know, we, in 1788, of course, the first uh, colonists arrived here in Australia, in Sydney. Um, and then, you know, our whole culture and our whole political landscape changed entirely. We were subjected to all sorts of forms of massacres and genocide, um, you know, some of the most brutal the world has ever seen. Uh, again, something that's, you know, not often talked about, um, you know, but we had massive, massive um, rates of death and murder in those first few years. You know, they estimated that there was, and this is the conservative estimate, that there was at least a million Aboriginals in Australia when the first colonizers arrived. By the time they'd done a census of our population, I think it was two or three decades after they first arrived in the early 1800s, um, our population was down to something like 30 or 40,000. So, you know, like from a million or more down to 30, 40,000, like they wiped out well over 90% of our population in just a few short decades. Um, you know, we haven't seen those levels of genocide in terms of the racial populations um, elsewhere around the world. You know, obviously we've seen similar levels of genocide in terms of nationality, religion, ethnicity, but not in terms of actual, you know, racial populations, racial demographics. Oh, me. So, um, yeah, you know, there was all sorts of ways that this happens. You know, they gave us um, contaminated rations. They would give us blankets that were um, laced with all sorts of poisonous inhalants. Uh, they would poison our waterways. And of course, they would just go forth and blatantly murder our people, uh, you know, through guns and um, torturous methods as well. Um, I'm not sure uh, what, look, there's some things that I could talk about, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be triggering for anybody in the group though. So maybe I won't go into too much detail of the actual savage things that they would do to us. But, um, you know, like to put it, you know, just vaguely, I suppose, um, you know, they weren't above going out murdering little babies, women, children, elders, um, literally anyone they came across, they would slaughter. And they wouldn't do it in just a quick, humane, bullet to the head fashion. It would quite often be a very slow, torturous, um, harmful death. Um, this has obviously, you know, had massive um, flow on effects in terms of intergenerational trauma and in terms of you know, the way our society and culture is structured today, um, along with, you know, other things as well, which I'm going to touch on soon, um, you know, such as our dispossession of our natural resources and our lands and waters, as well as our dispossession of our sovereignty and the corruption of our self-determination. Uh, so um, I suppose we'll move on a bit more to the modern stuff now. Um, again, if anybody has any questions later on, do feel free to ask away. So sorry, I just bringing something up. I had some notes up here. All right, so I suppose I'm um, looking through a modern lens. We take the position that Australia is under an imperialist occupation. Um, not many people think of Australia as an imperialist, uh, as an imperialist um, occupation. 
but you know, at the end of the day, it is. Um, I'm going to start off to just a quote from Clinton Fernandez and his more recent book, Sub Imperial Power. Being an imperial power means exerting a controlling influence on other countries' sovereignty. It can be established through different ways economic, social or cultural dependence, political collaboration between both countries' elites, the threat or use of military force, coups, intelligence operations, trade agreements, and investment treaties. Today, the United States sit at, sits at the apex of a hierarchical, structured imperialist system. So, uh, one of the things that we've been doing with the BPU lately is we have been looking at, I suppose you could say, updating a lot of the definitions for things that exist and updating a lot of the theories that exist around stuff like liberation, um, economics, and politics. So, we ultimately take the position that there is many different political ideologies and theories and many different revolutionary movements across the world that we can definitely learn from. There is a lot of um, good things to take away from a lot of these different theories and ideologies and movements. There is also you know, some things that they've obviously done wrong and things that we can learn from so we don't make similar mistakes. So the Black People's Union um, takes the ideological viewpoint that there is no one theory that proper properly um, addresses all of the 21st century contradictions of capitalism, as well as the primary contradiction here in Australia, which is colonization. So as a part of this, um, I suppose you could say theoretical writing, we have come up with a few different definitions and stuff. Um, and one of them I want to talk about quickly is just our stance on anti-imperialism. So the Black People's Union is a First Nations led revolutionary organization we have strong anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, and anti-imperialist principles. Our goal is to enforce the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and achieve full self-determination. We believe our struggle is a part of a larger global struggle against colonization, capitalism, and imperialism. And we stand in solidarity with all oppressed workers around the world who are fighting for their liberation as well. We recognize that workers are the backbone of society and that our struggle for self-determination is intimately connected with the struggle for workers' rights and economic justice. Indigenous and minority workers of the world have a long history of being the most oppressed and exploited members of the workforce. As Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we have a unique perspective on the impacts of capitalism and imperialism on our communities and on our land. And you know, we understand how these two systems intrinsically are linked. So imperialism is not a vague concept. It is the reality of historical economic dominance by the British and then subsequently the American empire. Our position is that here in Australia, anti-imperialism means resisting the Australian colony. The only government that we have the ability to change is our own. Therefore, our responsibility is to uphold the colony, oh, sorry, is to hold the colony accountable for its imperialist occupation of sovereign indigenous nations and its wider role in enforcing the American imperial world order. So as such, the BPU's decision is that Australia is not actually an exploited country in the US led imperialist system, like some would argue but is itself a sub-imperial power. As such, it is an active and willing participant in the US-led order, and it is our international duty to denounce any warmongering narratives about what Australia has deemed enemy state. And it is a crucial foundation upon which our anti-colonialism rests, as is only through critical anti-imperialist resistance that the people, lands, and waters of this continent can be liberated from the capitalist interests of the colony. So anti-imperialism is relevant for all Australians, but you know, particularly it's relevant for Aboriginal communities and people. The continued colonization of this continent is played out in the destruction of land and the extraction of resources for foreign profits, um, namely the US and the UK. It is this foreign profit that is the imperialism that we speak of. Most of the largest companies and much of our lands and natural resources in Australia are ultimately American and British owned. Our position is that Australia is a smaller imperial power that is part of and sustains a trilateral imperial order on occupied indigenous lands and which upholds the British American empire and destroys and exploits indigenous resources and nations in order to do so. This imperialism is not limited to our shores though. At various points in the colony's history, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, uh, the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu have all come under Australia's economic control. And today it continues to interfere with the sovereignty of these nations, as well as nations like Timor-Leste, Nauru, West Papua, and many more. And this is before we even get into our role in the wars in the Middle East. This is just talking about 
our own local neighbourhood. So the BPU's position is that the Australian colony is not excluded um, in the US imperial system, but is actually a sub-imperial power occupying some 300 indigenous nations. The colony is an active and willing participant in the US-led order. There's you know, much um, evidence to see this right across um, the world in terms of you know, what we do supporting America, upholding their laws, um, following into their wars, providing them with the natural resources they need to go out and you know, engage in these wars, um, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff. So you know, Australia itself has an advanced military and several intelligence agencies that operate within the region and abroad as well, um, or to uphold this American interest. Australia's trade and investment agreements are organised with a similar goal in mind. The super profits in this country and the role of this country lies in the extraction of resources and the supply of goods for private companies. The BPU understands that if we're going to tackle the issue of land and resource theft, then what we ultimately need to do is have a proper understanding of what it is we are actually tackling. So, you know, like, think about it, like how can this domination of our continent take place? And not just Aboriginals, but not even the wider Australian population has the same. You know I mean, like, I'm not just talking from an Aboriginal perspective here, I'm talking from a working class perspective as well. Um, you know, when you look around, Australia is a very, very rich continent. We have massive amounts of natural resources. Some of them are the biggest deposits in the world, like uranium, for example. Um, I think we have something like one third of the world's uranium. It's the biggest deposit in the world. Um, but we're digging this up and we're sending it overseas to be used in you know, nuclear submarines, nuclear weapons, as well as to power you know, countries and cities elsewhere across Australia. Why, oh, sorry, elsewhere across the world. Why here in Australia, um, our people, again, Aboriginal and non-Indigenous, when I say our people, um, our people aren't seeing any benefit from this. You know, we're not receiving any sort of royalties. We don't have any say in this. And ultimately these companies are coming in, destroying the land because they're mining in an unsustainable way, um, or mining's unsustainable, I should say, they're mining in a dis destructive way where it's not sustainable for the climate or the environment. And you know, as a result, it's impacting the lives of not just indigenous people, but all people in Australia. So yeah, so not only is Australia providing the raw materials for empire, but we are also deeply integrated into the American imperial machine and its intelligence and military apparatus in particular. Australia can cooperate in the so-called rules-based international order with relative ease and freedom because of its imperial conquests in the region. The imperial trade agreements we have with our neighbors and forcing the colony's integration into the American power structure. Uh, meanwhile, our people, again, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but more specifically Indigenous in this case, um, our people are dying and suffering, and our lands are dying and suffering, so that Australia's colony's ruling class can play this violent role in the rest of the world. So that being said, the, um, the BPU stands with all workers of the world who are subjected to the American Imperial Order, um, you know, we are in a position where we are trying to call on other fellow workers to work with us and to stand with us um, to condemn Australia's role in enforcing this brutal and destructive capitalist order, um, as well as to try and bring about some change and distance ourselves from this um, trilateral imperialist state of the UK, Australia and America, or as they've now gone and called themselves, AUKUS. All right, so... um. Yeah, that pretty much you know sums up our position on like imperialism. Um, again, you know this is something that we could talk on for hours. There's so much to cover and so much to go into, but you know we'll just briefly touch on it and we'll move on a bit. Um, I suppose talking about you know activism, um, there's much history, um, especially in the 60s and 70s, of indigenous civil rights movements here in Australia. Um, the 60s and 70s were our big sort of heyday for the Indigenous rights movement. Um, it's when we came the closest to actually, you know, having major successes and advancements. Um, you know, stuff like the Aboriginal Ten Embassy were established in the, uh, it was, oh, my brain's a bit foggy, but you know, back in the 60s, um, the Ten Embassy was set up. We also had, uh, Australia had its own version of the Black Panther Party. Uh, we had stuff like the Aboriginal legal services, Aboriginal medical services, and the Aboriginal housing services were all established back during this era. Um, originally when they were set up though, they were set up as very radical and revolutionary organizations. 
Um, unfortunately, though, over the years, the government slowly co-opted all these organisations that liberalised them, and now they're pretty... Look, I'm not going to say that they're useless, because, you know, they do obviously serve a function in our society, and they are better than nothing, but they are nothing like what they were originally set up to be, and they have been very de-radicalised and liberalised by the government over the decades. Um, I suppose, you know, another big thing that came out of the 60s and the 70s was our land rights movement. Um, you know, Indigenous people have always been demanding our land back since we were first dispossessed, but the 60s and the 70s really allowed that to be platformed more and for more discussions to be had around that and for that cause to advance a bit more. Um, unfortunately, though, oh, I won't say unfortunately, but you know, different people take different views on this sort of stuff. Um, you know, some people might think that native title is a good thing. Um, native title is actually a bad thing, though, the Native Title Act. Um, the Native Title Act all came about in the Howard government era as a way to try and prevent um, Indigenous people enforcing land rights and seeking land rights um, as a result of the Mabo decision back in 93, acknowledging that our sovereignty was still upheld. So yeah, uh, Howard brought in the Native Title Act as a way to, um, I suppose, breed, divide and conquer within our communities. And it's worked very well. Um, even to today, three decades later, we've got massive issues around Native Title. Um, it's called massive fractures within communities and between different communities. And at the end of the day as well, it's set up in such a way where it's not actually tangible. Um, it's not something that can't be dismissed. Um, we've seen recent examples of that, such as up in Jagalingu and Wangu country, up in Northern Queensland. They had a disagreement with a mining proposal that was going ahead. So the government extinguished their native title claim altogether, and now they don't even have a native title. So something that we really need to push for is land rights. And when we talk about land rights, uh, we're talking about land back ultimately. Because you know? at the end of the day, if we have a lease from the government, it's still land owned by the Commonwealth. It's still land that the government can come in, can take back from us whenever they choose to, or can you know legislate against or prevent us from doing stuff like accessing the natural resources or turn it into a primary mode of production. Um, there is places that have got land granted to them under various legislation. Um, one of them is actually my home community of Jervis Bay um, and Rec Bay. We have a where our land was legislated back to us back in 87 um, under the Jervis Bay Aboriginal Land Grant Act. But again, you know, this land grant act prevents us from being able to do stuff like set up primary industries on our land. You know, we can't go and have a farm on our land, for example. If we discovered natural resources under our land, we couldn't then go and mine them or sell them or anything like that. Um, at the end of the day, pretty much what it allows us to do is to have a house on the land. And even then, some places, their land grant acts don't even include that. Um, you know, it only includes access and use of the land, not actual ownership and custodianship of the land. So, you know, we can go out into land, we can camp, we can do traditional things on it like hunt, gather. Um, even then, that's very dodgy. Um, you know, we have people today locked up in prison for poaching because, you know, they went and took and abalone, for example, even though where they took it from was land that had been handed back under a land grant. So, you know, at the end of the day, these things don't actually count for much, um, which is why when we talk about land rights today, what we're actually talking about is land back. Um, and by land back, you know, we mean actually land back, not, you know, some sort of lease or legislation, but the full unconditional return of our land to be used by us how we choose. Um, so yeah, we do reject uh, stuff like native title and we are looking for our land back. Ultimately though, land back isn't something that, you know, it is a bit of a scary word for some people because of all the propaganda that's been put out there. But, you know, it's not something that the general mainstream non-Indigenous Australians need to fear. Um, if anything, it'll actually be something that would benefit the non-Indigenous working class greatly. Um, you know, we aren't coming for our land because we want to be the capitalists or we want to be the landlords. We want our land back so we can look after it properly and we can make sure that everyone's looked after properly. Now, as Indigenous people, when we talk about caring for country, one thing that a lot of non-Indigenous people don't recognise is we are talking about you as well. 
you know, you're here on this country, you're a part of this country. When we talk about caring for country, we're talking about caring for all of the people here. Our people have always been very um, inclusive. We aren't an exclusive people. So, you know, naturally we want what's best for everybody. Um, so Indigenous land back would mean stuff like, you know, abolishing um, these massive rents that we have and these massive, you know, housing prices that we have here in Australia. You know, Australia's got one of the highest um, housing prices in the world at the moment, both in terms of just generally speaking, as well as in terms of compared to our cost of living and our, you know, average wages in Australia. Um, land back would allow us to get rid of this um, capitalist system which sees individuals or corporations buying up you know hundreds of thousands of houses and then causing um, inflation and artificial scarcity which is driving the housing price up and locking most of the working class out of the opportunity to ever be able to own their own home. So you know something like land that would allow us to get rid of these systems in place that allow people to own multiple homes and to exploit their fellow um, you know person their fellow humans by demanding, you know, rent and mortgages at exorbitant prices, just so somebody has shelter from their elements and somewhere that they can go and sleep and be safe all night. You know, at the end of the day, we take the approach, and when I say we, I mean both the BQ and Indigenous people, we take the approach that, you know, housing and shelter is a basic human necessity and it's a basic human right. It's not something that we should have to slave away for. It's not something that we should have to struggle for. It's not something that you know people should be locked out of and denied because of their yearly wage or anything like that. It's something that we should all be entitled to. And in such a way where you know everybody should have a house, just like food and dinner, everyone should have a house before anybody gets seconds. That is a very fundamental principle um, that you can apply to not just housing, but a lot of things in the capitalist system. But um, yes, you know, also on top of you know housing and stuff like that, land back would ensure that our natural resources here in Australia were being used to actually benefit the people and weren't being dug up just so that some billionaire can pocket even more money. Um, you know, exploited, of course, from Indigenous land that they're occupying, as well as exploited from the labour of the general working class. Um, you know, it would mean that we could look after the land more sustainably. Right now, Australia has the highest extinction rates in the world. We have the highest deforestation rates in the world. Um, they've got massive um, cases of dryland salinity and topsoil erosion right across the interior of Australia as a result of unsustainable European farming practices. Um, land back would allow us to bring in more sustainable farming practices so that you know we could look after the environment as well as catering to everybody. Um, another thing you know like we can we can get right into this for hours but you know like just going off like the farming and stuff like that as well. Um, we would be then also be in a position where we could actually look after the food needs of everybody in Australia. You know, Australia creates more than enough food, yet we have kids who go hungry every night on the streets. You know, we have families that are going hungry, we have individuals that are going hungry. We have people that are choosing to skip meals because they have to pay their rent or they have to buy a medicine and they can't afford to do both. Um, it's not because there isn't enough food out there, it's just because of the way it's distributed. At the end of the day, uh, we chuck something like, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was something ridiculous, like 60% of our food goes in the waste. And this isn't food that we've bought from the shops, taken home and it's gone yuck in the fridge. I'm talking about 60% of our food goes to waste before it even hits the shelves at the shopping centre. Now, we could quite easily sustain all of the people's food needs, but because of this system, we are choosing not to. Um, so, you know, something like land back would allow us to, you know, gear production more towards actually benefiting the people as opposed to benefiting a minority. Um, another quick thing, sorry, I'm just going to, I'm starting to run a bit out of time because I want to have a discussion at the end. Another quick thing I just want to touch on, um, two things actually, is just our stances on treaty and our stances on a voice of parliament. So treaty is something that has been pushed for a long time in Australia um, by Indigenous grassroots activists and organisers, as well as you know, the broader Indigenous population. Um, with all due respect to you know, everybody that's come before me and to all of my elders, um, I personally 
striving for. Um, that ultimately that is just a continuation of the colonial agenda. And our analysis is very materialist based. Uh, you know, if we take a look at treaties in North America and treaties in New Zealand, for example, uh, that the English signed with the traditional, um, sorry, with the indigenous people there, uh, we see that a treaty hasn't actually done much for them. So, you know, if we look at the social stats of the Maldi, for example, they've got massive incarceration rates, just like Aboriginals do here in Australia. They've got massive rates of homelessness. They've got, you know, they're disproportionately uh, unemployed. They've got disproportionate literacy levels, um, disproportionate health stats, uh, a lower life expectancy than the general population in New Zealand, and, you know, home, higher homelessness rates, all sorts of stuff, just like we have here in Australia with our Indigenous population. Um, ultimately, a treaty hasn't done anything there to be able to circumvent that. Again, if you look at the US and we look at Canada, we see the same things again, all of their social stats in terms of, you know, uh, health, employment, education, housing, um, incarceration, etc. They're all massively disproportionate as well in their system, just like we are, we are here in Australia. Um, you know, treaties haven't done anything to be able to circumvent that in those nations. So why would we think it would do anything differently here in Australia? Um, we also look at, you know, the treaty violations. All three of those nations, Canada, the US and New Zealand, they routinely violate their treaties. Um, they have done so literally since the year that they were first signed. And sometimes they're violated to the extent where people actually lose their lives over this stuff. Um, you know, people are being murdered either systemically by being priced out of or locked out of shelter, food, etc., as well as being murdered by the actual, uh, you know, law enforcement and military personnel. Uh, you know, we look at places like, I think it was in Canada, uh, back in the 80s, they wanted to develop a golf course on lands that had been handed back as a part of the treaty negotiation. The Indigenous people there, you know, protested and tried to resist those. Um, as a result, somebody was actually shot and murdered and several more people were hospitalised as a result of which, you know, all over a golf course wanting to be put on Indigenous lands. And, you know, this treaty was supposed to protect these lands, but a golf course would come in and as a result of that, people were murdered. You know I mean? Like, why would we think that Australia, who has in many regards, an even worse track record than places like Canada, New Zealand, and even the US, why would we think that they would uphold a treaty any better than these other nations? So, you know, we are against a treaty um, with the government. That being said, what we do advocate for instead as an alternative is that Indigenous nations come together, treaty with each other, so we can have a pan-Indigenous movement um, that will provide us with the strength that we need to actually uh, reinforce stuff like our sovereignty. Um, just quickly, um, what is sovereignty? I know we hear a lot of stuff about it being some sort of spiritual notion. Um, yes, it is a spiritual notion, but it is much, much more than that. And the government, you know, talks about it as a spiritual notion as a way to try and detract and discredit and undermine what sovereignty actually means. So the BPU's definition of sovereignty is that the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is an unfettered right held in collective possession by the members of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, which grants usage, access and custodianship to the land, waters and natural resources of this continent, as well as the right for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to exercise an unimpeded and collective self-determining government over our own political, economic and social affairs. So, you know, when we talk about sovereignty, we're talking about self-determination, we're talking about land back and access to our natural resources. Um, at the end of the day, our sovereignty is unceded, but rights only exist so far as they can be enforced. Um, at present, Indigenous people aren't in any position to actually enforce our sovereignty and enforce our rights to self-determination. So what the BPU's position is, is that you know, Indigenous people should come together, form a treaty with ourselves, you know, the many hundreds of nations across this continent, and then we can act together as one to actually be in a better position to try and enforce our sovereignty and self-determination. Um, so yeah, so that's ultimately what we're calling for. Um, I suppose just super quickly, we're running out of time, just super quickly as well, um, I just want to touch on the voice of the parliament. Um, I won't go into it too much because you know, I could, again, talk for hours on this, but I suppose ultimately to summarise it, 
Uh, the BPU is against the voice of parliament as well. Um, you know, it is a, at the end of the day, it is just a tokenistic advisory role. It doesn't give us any power to actually do anything. Um, it's not anything new either. We've had literally dozens of similar advisory bodies that the government has established over the past 50 years. Um, every single prime minister over the past 50 years has created their own indigenous advisory body of some form or another, as well as you know, plenty of other government levels have created their own. Um, we have seen no results from any of these. Uh, what we have seen every time is that they cherry pick individuals who don't actually represent the interests of the broader indigenous community. Um, even if they are elected, they still do not represent these interests because anybody who is in a, gets put into a position to be elected in the first place, um, you know, I don't want to talk badly about people, but anyone who's already in that position to be elected, you've got to kind of question where their class interests lie, uh, where their upbringings lie, and you know, what sort of position they actually play within our broader communities. So yeah, so ultimately we are against the voice of, par um, the voice of parliament. We do encourage people to vote no. We see it as racist in itself. It's very paternalistic. Um, you know, it takes the viewpoint that ultimately Indigenous peoples aren't smart enough or capable enough to manage our own affairs and that we need the broader white Australian government to look after us and to manage us um, much in the same way as they've been trying to since they set up the first mission back at the start of the 1800s out in Blacktown. All right, so that kind of wraps it up a bit, I suppose. But um, yeah, if anybody's got any questions or wants me to go into any more details on any particular things, um, please do ask away. Thank you.